In 1947, a plane with a V-shaped tail sparked a revolution, then quickly became America's aviation scandal. They called it a fatal flaw, the Doctor Killer. Yet here is the truth. What was feared as an engineering disaster outlasted every rival. It flew for 70 years, while headlines blamed it for mid-air breakups and shattered lives. Was this tale really a death sentence, or was the real danger something no designer could control? The answer begins with Walter Beach's bold gamble in a world hungry for speed. America in 1946 was restless and flush with optimism. The war had ended, factories were humming, and for the first time in history, middle-class families could dream of owning their own airplane. More than 7,000 combat aircraft had rolled out of Beach's Wichita lines just a year before, but now the market demanded something different a machine for businessmen, doctors, and families who wanted to travel on their own schedules in comfort and style. Walter Beach saw the opportunity as clearly as anyone. His vision was not another trainer or a leftover military surplus. He wanted a business aircraft, a personal transport that would make a statement on the ramp and in the air. The design brief for Beach's new project was ambitious. All metal construction, four seats, a plush cabin, and a low wing that looked more like a fighter than a farm tool. The Bonanza would have retractable tricycle landing gear, a leap beyond the tail draggers, and fixed gear singles that still dominated airfields. Under the hood, a Continental E-185 engine promised 165 horsepower, later boosted to 185 with a controllable pitch propeller for smooth, efficient climbs. The prototype first took to the skies on December the 22nd, 1945, with test pilot Vern Carstens at the controls. By the time the Bonanza received its full type certificate in March 1947, Beach had already logged 1,500 hours of test flying. That was an aggressive program for a civil aircraft. What emerged was a machine that could cruise at 175 miles per hour and top out just shy of 185 miles per hour. The cabin was quiet and comfortable, trimmed in leather and chrome, with room for a family or a business team. Advertisements called it the Cadillac of the sky and for good reason. Compared to the Cessna 195, a high wing, radial engine relic with fixed gear, the Bonanza looked and felt like tomorrow. It was fast, sleek, and modern the kind of airplane that turned heads and drew crowds at every airport it visited. Demand was immediate and overwhelming. More than 1,000 Bonanzas were built in the first production year, each one snapped up by professionals who wanted more than just a way to get from A to B. They wanted speed, prestige, and the freedom to go where the roads did not. The Bonanza delivered all of that and more. But underneath the polished aluminum and futuristic lines, Beach's team was already wrestling with a defining question. How do you make a plane this fast and this light stand out from everything else in the sky? The answer would come in the shape of a tail no one had ever seen before. The V-tail wasn't born out of a committee or a focus group. It was a gamble, a bold stroke from engineers who wanted to break the rules of what a tail could be. In those first design meetings, Beach's team sketched every possibility on the drafting table, the familiar cross, the T-tail, even a twin boom. But it was the V, angled up and out like a pair of outstretched wings, that kept pulling their attention. The math was seductive. Two surfaces instead of three meant less weight, fewer hinges, fewer points for drag to gather, and slow the airplane down. Every intersection on a conventional tail was a parasite, robbing speed and efficiency. The V-tail promised to clean up the airflow, cut drag, and give the Bonanza a higher cruise on the same power. Aerodynamicist Jerry Gordon and his colleagues ran the numbers, then built wind tunnel models to prove them. The V-tail could deliver the same control authority as a traditional tail, but with fewer pounds and a smaller profile slicing through the air. For a plane that was already pushing the limits of civilian speed, every ounce and every knot counted. It wasn't just about performance, though. The V-tail was a showstopper. In an age obsessed with rockets and jet-age lines, the Bonanza's butterfly tail looked like tomorrow. 
It was unlike anything sitting on the ramp in 1947, where the competition wore boxy upright fins, the Bonanza's tail leaned back, sharp and confident. It caught the sunlight, drew stares, and made the airplane instantly recognizable from the ground or the sky. Beach's marketing team didn't waste a second. Ads splashed across aviation magazines showed the V-tail silhouetted against the horizon, promising buyers they'd own the future. Cadillac of the sky was more than a slogan. It was a challenge to every other airplane builder in America, and customers answered. More than a thousand bonanzas rolled out in that first year alone, each one snapped up by professionals eager to leave the old world behind. The V-tail became a status symbol, a badge of ambition. If you flew one, you weren't just a pilot, you were a pioneer. But every innovation comes at a price. The engineers knew it. They debated the trade-offs late into the night. Would the new tail be as forgiving as the old? Would it handle turbulence, crosswinds, the mistakes of an eager owner? For now, the numbers looked good. The wind tunnel said yes, the order book said yes, the V-tail was ready for its debut, and the world was lining up to see if this beautiful risk would pay off. The Bonanza drew a certain kind of owner. These were men who wore crisp suits to the office, not coveralls to the hangar. Doctors, attorneys, and executives, people used to making decisions with confidence, found themselves drawn to the promise of speed and status. For many, the Bonanza was more than a machine. It was a symbol of a rival. The checkbook could handle the price, and the ego could handle the challenge. But the logbook often told a different story. A typical new Bonanza pilot in the late 1940s or early 1950s might have logged fewer than 200 hours, often all in basic trainers. Some had just enough experience to pass a checkride, but not enough to know what they did not know. The jump from a slow, forgiving tail dragger to a 175 miles per hour retractable gear rocket was massive. Yet, for a generation raised on post-war optimism, caution felt like an insult. The Bonanza's marketing only fueled that confidence. Businessman's Express, the ads promised. Go anywhere, anytime. The reality was more complicated. Many of these new owners had demanding careers and lives built around tight schedules. Missing a surgery or a court date was not an option. The pressure to get there, what pilots call get there, itis, became a silent co-pilot. When weather looked questionable or daylight faded, the temptation was to trust the airplane's speed and climb performance to outrun the elements. Instrument ratings were rare, and even when pilots had them, actual experience in clouds was often limited. The Bonanza's clean lines and powerful engine could turn a short hop into a cross-country sprint, but they could also turn a casual mistake into a crisis. Experience was no substitute for time in the air, a sudden descent through a cloud deck, a moment's disorientation, and the airplane would respond with the urgency of a fighter. In a Bonanza, the margin for error shrank. Where a slower, draggy trainer might give a wandering mind time to recover, the Bonanza punished hesitation. The airspeed needle did not just move, it lunged. A gentle spiral could become a tightening dive in seconds, and the pilot's workload soared. The accident records from the era paint a clear pattern. Loss of control in instrument conditions, overspeed in a spiral, and structural limits quietly exceeded. Most of these pilots were not reckless thrill seekers. They were high achievers, confident in their abilities, but unprepared for the ways a high-performance airplane could magnify a small lapse. The Bonanza did not create these risks. It simply revealed them, faster and more brutally than any aircraft that had come before. The airplane was never just a machine. For many, it was a test of judgment, humility, and respect for physics. Some passed, others paid dearly for the lesson. By the early 1950s, the Bonanza's reputation had shifted from admiration to anxiety. Newspaper headlines piled up, each one darker than the last. A physician, a lawyer, a businessman, names that once filled society pages now appeared in accident reports. The pattern was impossible to ignore. Witnesses described the same sequence again and again. A distant roar overhead, a sudden bang, and then a rain of twisted aluminum falling through the sky. In cornfields and pastures across the Midwest, 
investigators found the unmistakable V-tail, torn from the fuselage, lying yards from the rest of the wreckage. The Bonanza's speed, once its greatest selling point, became the focus of suspicion. Local papers and national magazines latched onto the story. The label Dr. Killer began to circulate, first in hangar gossip and then in print. The aviation press dissected every accident, pointing to the same grim details. A well-dressed professional, a fast airplane, a flight plan that ended in disaster. The public wanted answers. Was it the tail or was it the man in the left seat? Regulators took notice. The Civil Aeronautics Administration and later the FAA launched reviews of the Bonanza's accident record. Insurance companies quietly raised premiums on V-tail models. The numbers were damning. In certain years, the fatal in-flight failure rate for V-tail Bonanzas was reported as as much as two dozen times higher than for their straight-tail siblings. The data did not always tell the whole story, but for families reading the morning paper, the conclusion was clear. The Bonanza was dangerous, and the V-tail was to blame. The stories grew more lurid with each passing year. The press described doctors flying into storms, lawyers pressing on through fog, executives trusting their luck and their shiny new airplanes. The Bonanza, reporters said, was too much machine for too little training. The nickname spread as a warning and sometimes as a punchline at every small town airport in America. If you want to get rid of your doctor, buy him a Bonanza, one old pilot quipped. Behind the gallows humor, the fear was real. The label did more than damage sales, it cast a shadow over every V-tail on the ramp. Prospective buyers hesitated, owners grew defensive. Beechcraft's engineers found themselves defending not just their design, but their integrity. The company faced mounting pressure from regulators, insurers, and the public. The question grew louder. Was the V-tail a fatal flaw, or was something else at work? The only way forward was through the wreckage. Investigators began to dig deeper, searching for patterns among the debris. Each twisted rudivator, each shattered spar, became a clue. The answer, they hoped, would separate rumor from reality and put an end to the Bonanza's most notorious nickname. A V-tail does not just look different, it works different. Instead of separate surfaces for pitch and yaw, the Bonanza tail uses two diagonal blades called rudivators. Each rudivator takes orders from both the control yoke and the rudder pedals. Pull back on the yoke and both rudivators move up together, pitching the nose skyward. Press a rudder pedal and the surface is split. One goes up and the other goes down, twisting the airplane left or right. The result is mechanical choreography where every input is mixed and blended before it reaches the sky. It is not two taps, one for hot and one for cold, it is a mixer tap for air, blending the pilot's intentions into a single, coordinated response. But that elegance brings complexity. Each rudivator must be perfectly balanced, both in weight and in timing. If one lags or vibrates, the forces can feed on themselves. That is where air elasticity comes in, the dance between air and structure. As the Bonanza accelerates, air pushes harder against the tail, if the speed crosses a certain line, called VNE, the never exceed speed, the tail can start to shake in a way that is not just turbulence, but self-excited vibration. Flutter. In seconds, a calm surface can turn violent, flexing and twisting at frequencies the metal cannot survive. The difference between a safe flight and disaster can be just a handful of knots on the airspeed indicator. In the Bonanza, the margin for error is razor thin. The tail is not fragile, but it is honest. It will warn you once. Ignore the limits, and physics takes over. Wind tunnel tests did not care about reputations. They cared about numbers, about what happened when air pressed hard against metal at the edge of the envelope. In the late 1950s, beach engineers and FAA specialists loaded V-tail Bonanza models into tunnels and test rigs searching for the truth behind the breakups. The data told a clear story. The tail was not weak, but it was vulnerable when pushed past its limits. The structure could twist and vibrate in ways the original design had not fully anticipated. Torsional stiffness, the ability of the tail to resist twisting, was the key. When the C-35 model introduced a longer cord, 
It gave the tail more leverage, but not enough internal strength to match. At high speeds, especially in turbulence or in a spiral dive, the forces could build until the tail began to flex and resonate. That is when Flutter could strike, fast, violent, and catastrophic. The solution was not a whole new tail. It was a small wedge-shaped piece of metal fitted to the leading edge of each stabilizer, the cuff. This subtle reinforcement changed the game. The cuff stiffened the structure and raised the flutter margin well above the aircraft's never exceed speed. With the cuff in place, even a gust or a momentary overspeed would not tip the balance. FAA made the retrofit mandatory through airworthiness directives, and mechanics across the country began installing the kits. The fix worked, and flight breakups dropped sharply. But the real lesson was not just about hardware. Beechcraft and FAA doubled down on training, teaching pilots to respect the red line and the realities of spiral dives. The Bonanza could still run away if provoked, but now the tail was no longer the weak link. The evidence had spoken, and the design stood vindicated if you listened to what the numbers had to say. Even now, the Bonanza's silhouette crosses our skies, a reminder that innovation always walks a razor's edge between risk and reward. As new pilots chase speed and technology, the lesson endures. No design is safer than the judgment behind the controls. Mastery, not machinery, keeps us flying. Would you trust yourself with that legacy? Let us hear your answer below.